The Graphic Histories Podcast. I got bit by a radioactive bug. I tried experimental drugs. Went up for a stroll on a gamma testing range. I found an enchanted urucane. I made a serum that made me small. I modified the serum so it would make I me call. I got radioactive isotope in my Greetings, comic fans, and welcome to the Graphic Histories Podcast. My name is Andre Mayette, and I'm your host. And big thanks, Ugla the Mock, for our theme song, Superpowers. And once again, thank you, gentle listener, for tuning in. It's a pleasure to have you here. And oh boy, am I excited for this episode. Rob Gilroy is a uh, a comic artist. Um, he was the artist for Chew, a long-running book for Image Comics, creator own book he did with um, John Lehman. And he's doing his current own creator-owned book that he writes and draws called Farmhand, which is excellent. I've always been a huge fan of his work. I'm a huge fan of Chew and um, loved it since I read the first issue. If if you've never read it before, I I can't suggest it enough. The concept is sort of out there, um, sort of poking fun at the, like, pretension of, like, culinary stuff with, like, hipstery stuff, which we talk about in the interview. And, uh, but basically it revolves around a, a concept of, a sibopath, which is someone who can see the history of an object or, or person by consuming part of it. So, um, you know, this this guy gets a job working with the government to try to help solve crimes, and it goes on from there. But, man, it is really fun, really kind of subversive, different type of comic with a really unique voice that uh, was certainly changed. Uh, I would go so far as to say it has changed the industry as far as what's acceptable as a book there are books that are out there with pretty crazy concepts that probably wouldn't be allowed to be out there if not for the success of Chew. And it is fantastic. And Rob, uh, his art style is very unique. And I've always been a big fan of it. And man, it was a real honor to get to talk to him. And that's coming up in a little bit. In the meantime, health update for me. Uh, feeling good. I got to see the doctor and uh, it looks like the old myocarditis uh, is uh, fading off in the distance. I have to get further blood tests, another echo and all this other stuff in my heart. Uh, the basic, what he explained to me was the, the inflammation of the heart is um, a result of, it's not actually the virus, it's your body's immune response to the virus that gets into your blood. Um, they can't tell if I got it from the COVID vaccine um, because it was like two months after I got the second dose that, that I came down with this. So the timing is a bit off. Normally it's within like 10 days. Uh, but whether it is or isn't, I still am emphatic that you should go get your second shot. Uh, get all the shots and uh, and do your part to kind of help get this underway. And if you are, you know, an anti-vaccination person, um, I disagree with you. Um, but, you know, I don't want to get into that sort of debate because I've seen enough of them. And I don't know. I don't know, man. I always say when it comes to arguing with stuff on the inter- people on the Internet that you need to... Uh, you know, you're not going to change someone's mind arguing with them on Facebook. I truly don't believe that. Uh, so, you know, some, some of the people that are that are arguing is is hilarious, really. Um, some people got into like an argument on a like a comment thread on a post I made that didn't really have anything to do with the vaccine, uh, but somebody just was just like, "Well, you need double vaccinations to go," and I'm not going to go to this thing that you you post it. And then someone else is like, "You should get them. You're an idiot if you don't." And then it was just going back and forth, back and forth down my my comment thread, which is <laughs> kind of funny when you're like brought into these things that you don't want to be brought into but incidentally through social media you kind of are attached to it so you're getting all these notifications when they're talking to each other and i just want to be like guys please move on this has nothing to do with me go argue in a private chat but you know them are the breaks but uh yeah in the real world we lost norm mcdonald last week which is really sad um big fan of him as a comedian he's canadian of course as well which is always a point of pride for us when one of ours you know makes it big um, I'm a big fan of Mark Maron's podcast, which is kind of an inspiration for this, WTF. And whenever someone passed away, he always reposts the interview that he had with them if they were on a show. And, and the Norm one came up like the day after he died. 
And uh, I listened to it the other day because I hadn't heard it the first time around. And yeah, he was such an insightful, like beyond the comedy, just as a person, he was such an insightful, interesting person with a lot of ideas. And, and you know, he was sick with, with cancer for about 10 years fighting it. And he didn't really tell anybody, including people close to him. So the idea that he was kind of doing this struggle, but in this interview, which was about 10 years ago, because uh, it was 2011, he says, you know, getting out of his own head about death and about uh, cancer and about like things ravaging the body that really concerns him. And, you know, he's really focused on that and it's really, really sticking with him, which makes me wonder if he'd already had the diagnosis by that point or if he hadn't, then, oh, pretty prescient. You know, it's uh, really surreal to listen to an interview where someone talks at length about their fear of death and their fear of dying of some disease uh, after they, they died of a disease. So, um, yeah, it was it was poignant, but other, aside from that, it was like a, a great interview. I, I love that show. I highly suggest it if you don't listen to it already. Uh, go give it a listen because it's great. You know, it gives insight into people. You really learn about some of these sort of the facade of these celebrities and who they really are deep down. And, and it was definitely the impetus for my idea for this show to kind of bring that model to, you know, the sci-fi comic world and really get in and learn who these people are and not just, you know, a rudimentary look at here, here's my history, but here's why I do the things I do and, and how I am and, and what inspired me to be the person I am. And things like that interest me more than just someone talking about the, you know, I went to A to B to C to D. And I really like digging into those things with people, and, and uh, I hope you do too. But enough of all that. Let's get into today's interview with Rob Gilroy. <laughs> Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing all right, man. Trying to get back in the swing of things after Labor Day. Ah, uh, you have a nice day off? It was all right. Running yeah. around with the in-laws and barbecues and all that stuff. Ah, uh, you're in the south, right? And in uh, Lafayette? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, about two hours from New Orleans. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, where are you at? Nova Scotia, Canada. Oh, geez. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you, ever been, you ever been down this way? No, no, no. I've been to Canada a few times, but never to Nova Scotia. Now, how far did you get Toronto? I did Toronto and Calgary. Oh, nice. Those are two nice cities. Yeah, very. yeah. yeah. How are things in Nova, in Nova Scotia? Uh, not too bad. It's starting to, we're hitting into fall a little bit. It's still pretty warm out, but uh, it's getting a little cooler. I imagine your warm season is all year round down there. Yeah, yeah. We don't really have a whole lot of cold at all. <laughs> um, I mean, usually it's starting to cool, cool down a bit now, but I mean, usually it's... um. I mean, usually it's kind of intolerable during the summers, so mm -hmm. it's getting a bit more tolerable now, but, you know, not soon enough for our liking. Yeah, I hear you. Our season's yeah. kind of, what I explain to people that I talk to on here that uh, don't know the area is, is New York is a pretty good barometer for how our weather works, so, okay, because we're just above them, Boston, and then a little bit further up the coast, so usually okay. our seasons kind of follow, you know, what New York is like, so, okay. so we're getting into okay. the fall cold season. Cool, man. Well, thanks for being on. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, yeah, no problem. We've been uh, talking about doing this for a little bit now. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate you finding the time. I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, Chew was one of my all-time favorite books, so it's it's a real honor to have you here. Cool. And uh, and I read a bit of Firmhand as well, which I'm really enjoying and looking forward to reading more. So Awesome, awesome. Yeah, cool. So uh, where did you begin? Is this Did you grow up in Lafayette? Yeah, yeah, born and raised. Um, yeah, I, I kind of... Uh, I mean, there wasn't a lot going on here in the 80s, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, I mean, comics, you know, I, I was introduced to it by a couple uncles. I had a couple uncles that were really kind of like your prototypical comic book geeks. Mm. Um, like they were really, really into uh, old school Chris Claremont, you know, X-Men, you know, Teen Titans, uh, George, George Perez, Teen Titans and uh, a lot of old school stuff. And they used to just have a huge trunk full of comics in the closet. And every time I, I'd go over I would just tear that stuff out and flip through them and everything. And uh, yeah, I just never really, I never looked at it as a career. I just, I thought it was just really cool, fun stuff um, that I just gravitated to. And I, I started collecting on my own, uh, like fourth grade. Because mm -hmm. um, I had a couple other, for the first time I had friends that were also comic book geeks. Um, so this is around the time, this is in the early nineties. So this is Rob Liefeld on cable mm -hmm. uh, on uh, uh, New Mutants. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Image Comics was just getting started. I, you know, I, I started basically working 
my grandparents had a, had a janitorial service. So at some point I decided I needed to start making some money to buy my own stuff. Um, you know, Good I had idea. ambitions, you know, I had toys I wanted. I had, you know, I had comics I wanted. So started working with them, started making, you know, a little, a little change here and there. And every Friday we go to the comic shop, uh, big, big comics was the name of the shop back then. Uh, we go there every Friday. My grandfather would take me and I just started collecting all my own stuff. And I just remember going in this, to the store one Sunday or one uh, Friday and the, the shop owner's like, Hey man, you know, there's this new stuff coming out, you know, um, it's called image comics. Um, so it's all like new stuff. It's new number ones, new heroes. And I thought, all right, cool. You know, I'll check it out. I remember getting the comic shop, uh, news, news, uh, newsletter, mm-hmm. um, that, that had like the preview for spawn and I thought, okay, this looks a little scary for me. <laughs> like I was like <laughs> age eight or nine at the time. Yeah. Um, so it was a bit, a bit hardcore for me. Uh, I was more of a Rob Liefeld, uh, brigade fan back in the day which was a pretty uh, so, rough comic too i uh, <laughs> like i read that when i was a kid and i remember find, like issue two or three like coming across it there's one where the whole team just gets like obliterated and there's arms <laughs> and guts and he grabs the guy by the right. stomach and pulls his intestines out <laughs> like, right. you know, so i remember right. reading that being this is it was either that or blood strike but they kind of they were sister comics and i remember reading it going like huh, you know yeah. around the same age time so yeah i just remember really liking you know every you know, it's a team of heroes. They all have their own powers and things. They, you know, so there's always the guy who has the sharp fingers, who's got claws for fingers, who like cut stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, there's always a guy with like, I mean, it's a it's a life felt comic, so mm-hmm. it's just pockets everywhere, pouches. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say shoulder pads <laughs> and pouches. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, that was all me. So I yeah. just started collecting from there. Um, you know, Death of Superman, Nightfall, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Um, I collected all that stuff. So that I still have tons of that stuff. I, I, I mean, my comic shop started doing deals where they, you know, they're like, well, you know, Superman's dying. So like, there's like, you know, this funeral for a friend, there's reign of the Superman. That's all this. And we have, and there were like collector's editions and like newsstand editions. Oh yeah. The and covers they had, with they the, the symbols that they yes, know, cut out. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. And they had all of the, you know, the chromium covers and, um, you know, they had a flat deal where you could pay, I think, 20 bucks uh, a month or something. And you got like all these different covers. So I just thought, oh, sweet. You know, and the guy, the, the shop owner totally sold me on it. You know, he's just telling me like, you know, it's great. You can have the news, you know, newsstand edition. You just read yourself. But you have, you know, the fancy collector's edition that you just put in a, in a bag and board and you just wait for collect to collect money. And I still have. Are you still books. waiting on that? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm still, like they're still at like my mom's house in the closet. <laughs> I often um, joke. Uh, of, uh, I let my local comic shop in Halifax. Uh, it's the, the major city here. Um, the uh, the owner of, often talks about you know when everybody everybody brings in that Todd McFarlane Spider Man number one, and they're like <laughs> you know this has got to be worth something, and then like he pulls out a box of like a thousand of them, and it's like. <laughs> this is how flooded the market was at the time. Like it's it's right, right. worth less than whatever that is, the cover price. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I just I just loved it. Um, you know, stayed with it throughout high school, and I started drawing comics on my own back in uh, in the fourth grade. Also, I don't know where that idea came from. I mean, I always kind of sketched here and there for my own enjoyment, like kind of in the margins of the page and that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but that that year when I was in the fourth grade. And all this was going on, I just went home at some point and thought, eh, I think I just want to draw my own comic. Oh, cat. Yeah. <laughs> he often uh, makes a guest appearance on these shows. Oh, cool. That's Lebowski. Um, but, but yeah, I just decided to just make my own stuff. So I went home and started screwing around, made my own comic uh, in like an afternoon after school instead of doing homework or something, um, you know, on, on pink construction paper uh, with, you know, colored pencils and ballpoint pen and uh i don't even i think i showed a few people at school but i just it just bit me and then from there on i just i spent entire summers just just making mini comics just for myself um and it was all just you know su- you know spider-man versus you know the hulk or something mm-hmm. just just picking two random characters and giving them a reason to fight for an entire issue and that's pretty much it um and i just did that all through you know up until probably eighth grade or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I just never really thought of this as a real, a real job. 
I mean, we didn't have Comic Cons, we didn't have the internet. So, I mean, I never really thought about who makes this stuff. You know, I just, I just, I knew that there was, from what I had heard, uh, you know, it, it all took place in New York City because everything happened in New York City. Mm. You know, they're always either making comics or getting destroyed by supervillains like, constantly. Um, so I just figured you just sent in your stuff through the mail and maybe eventually somebody gets in contact with you and you get a job. And that's just how that works. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just didn't give it any thought. And I, I didn't really think of it as a viable career path until college. Um, I, so I, I graduated in 2000 and started going to my, my local university. And, you know, we didn't have a whole lot in the way of, I mean, we had an art program, but it wasn't fantastic. I mean, it was just, it, they were very hung. And they, I think there's just not snapping out of it now, but they're really into kind of your classical stereotypical artist thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can be a painter, but you don't want to actually make money doing, <laughs> with your art. Like, yeah, it's funny how those classes don't assume that you right. will. Like, they're just like, right. well, you learn to draw the naked guy and the naked girl. We'll give you a bowl of fruit and then send exactly. you on your way. And you'll probably teach a class like this someday. And that's the most you can maybe hope to get out of it. Right, right. But yes. there's a guy, you know, one of the professors had a beret and I used to give him <laughs> a hard time about it. Like, but, you, ever but God the, forbid, uh, you ever seen the movie Art School Confidential? No. Oh, it's a uh, Terry, uh, um, or not Terry, Daniel Klaus graphic novel that he, uh, the same guy did Ghost mm -hmm. World directed. And it's just about this kid that goes to art school and this whole other thing. But a friend of mine is an artist, like he does uh, paintings and stuff. I don't know if you can see the one behind me, but there's one on the wall. And uh, he, uh, I showed it to him and he got a big kick out of like all that pretension of our class, you know, <laughs> like the professor's sort of like still trying to make it as an artist. And he's like 60. Right. And, uh, right. you know, he just does triangles. This whole thing is triangles. Everything is just a different triangle and a different shape. So, right, uh, right. yeah. Yeah. It was all, it was a bunch of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, and I wanted to make, I, I really, I, I thought, I didn't think of comics as a viable path, but I did think video games seemed plausible and I liked video games. So we had a computer animation program. Uh, so I thought, cool, like that's, you know, that'll get me on the path. I was in it for one semester. I hated it. Um, it was, I mean, I could draw something in five minutes and it would take me months and months to render that in, in the computer. Plus we had garbage computers on top of that. <laughs> um, so at some point I just, uh, you know, I was taking a painting class and I spoke to the professor and I'm like, yeah. And I had started making my own comics again. Um, and it was all sort of biographical stuff. I started working for the university's, uh, uh, newspaper. Mm -hmm. And I was the uh, I was the staff cartoonist, and I did that for like five years. You just, uh, just submit something, and they took it, or yeah, like my first or second semester. Because uh, again, I I mean, even the backtrack it further in high school, my last two years of high school, I was the editor in chief of my school newspaper, oh, okay. and I was also I was also the artist. So like I would write, and I also basically like I came up with the name of the newspaper. Like we started that we started from scratch, and I was basically the guy who like. Um, had that kind of cast the vision for the thing i did all the art for it but i also was the guy who like dropped the hammer and said like okay you kids stop screwing around and get to work like you have a deadline <laughs> that kind of thing very which nice. is like with high school guy with high school folks was very, was very difficult mm -hmm. um it's like a group project got... every day in high school which is like, <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like the worst so i was always a kid who gets everything done it's like mm -hmm. god why am i always having to be this guy yeah. uh, but by the I time can, i got I to relate. college yeah, by the time I got to college, I had experience with newspapers. So when I found out my school had a paper, I thought, sweet. Like I, so I started paying attention. Eventually, my first or second semester, they were hiring for a staff cartoonist. I thought, sweet, I'm, I'm, I'm in. So I got the gig. Um, so I did that for like five years or so. And then it was like a serialized cartoon or like a political thing? Or what was the what was Both. The I, had, I had a weekly uh, political comic that uh, went with like, you know, there was like, the 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 democrat and there's the republican column and mine went right in the middle uh -huh. but i always sided with like with the democrat so everything i made was tied to the democrats guy's stuff which is a whole other bag of worms um <laughs> so but basically i i did that but i also did have some serialized stuff i had several different ones throughout my time there uh, some of it was biographical some of it was sort of um just old school serialized stuff, kind of topical and angsty as typical mm -hmm. college stuff tends to be. Mm -hmm. um, but during that time, I also started going, uh, making my own comics. I started going to conventions. I went to my first con 
in 2001, uh, I'd started making my own comics, like biographical stuff. So I had a portfolio and I started, uh, I started getting introduced to more indie, indie comics. Um, so like Jim, the food, you know, his, his, uh, stuff, uh, with Kevin Smith on Cl the clerks, the clerks mm -hmm. comic. Um, and also the clerks cartoon was really huge for me too. Um, so all of that as well. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. it was only like six episodes or something, but it was, fantastic. yeah, I got the DVD and I remember just plowing through it incredibly quickly. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. I'm excited to see the new one whenever they get that out. So uh, it'd be fun. I didn't even know they were making a new one. Well, they're making a third clerks movie. Uh, they just, they just oh, wrapped okay, filming okay. on it. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so yeah, during that time, I, uh, I found out from a buddy that was living in Houston, uh, that, Hey, you know, we're having a comic con here and you know, here's the flyer and i look at the flyer and jim of foods there and he was a huge influence on me i thought oh sweet like first comic-con my guy's there I'll, I'll i'll you know hop the greyhound bus i don't know why <laughs> and just you know hoofed it over there for a weekend and met jim and got uh he critiqued my work and was really really gracious but also on top of that and this is just some rinky thing like a uh, convention in a hotel Mm. No one was there on a Saturday. Like the poor, all the pros are just sitting around twiddling, twiddling their, th their thumbs. But when I think of the guest list, it's like Mark Wade was there. Oh, wow. Uh, Mike Poringo was there. Him oh, and Mark wow. Wade, had just, they, they had just started their Fantastic Four run. Oh, my God. That's amazing. That's my favorite run. Yeah. Fantastic. So I got, I got both of them to sign the uh, 99 cent issue yep. uh, of Fantastic Four. They both signed it. I actually have a, uh, I met Poringo briefly. He had actually, he had just finished drawing a, a thing commission for this guy. And the guy tried to hand him money and Mike just gave the money back. He's like, no, no, this is just for you. Don't worry about it. Oh, wow. And uh, like really, really sweet guy. Um, and uh, Scott Kurtz was there. Uh, and uh, Frank Cho was there. Mm, wow. Um, I mean, it was just Scott Morris, who's at Pixar now. Um, just crazy, crazy list. I and, find that even now at cons that like, like it's been a while, like I do art and stuff as well. So I usually I'm set up at them when I go now, but um, like back in the day when I was just a fan going, usually the comic guys didn't have big lines. It was, everyone was like wanting to see, you know, spike from Buffy or something like that. And then like, you know, I, I walk around and talk to Sergio Argones and like Stan Sakai and like Ty Templeton, all these guys that are just sitting there, you know, not right. doing anything. And uh, like, and, and I gave one of my books to uh, Sergio and he told me, come back tomorrow and we'll, we'll talk about it. And I did. And he had read it the night before and gave me a ton of notes, which is like the sweetest thing. When you meet these guys and you wow. realize they're just cool people. It's uh, yeah. it's very, very cool. Absolutely. So, I mean, but I mean, the critiques I got there really kind of propelled me forward. Um, I mean, getting, I had been making stuff and liking my own stuff, but when you, when you put something, when you put it in their hands and you, you see that light in their eyes and they're just like, Oh, you can do this. Like you absolutely can do this. That's when things took off for me. Mm -hmm. um, so from then, I just kind of kept on making my own thing. I came up with a plan that I go to a convention every six months. I was still in college. Um, so, you know, I was still doing the weekly strips and I, I got more experimental. You know, I learned I taught myself Photoshop and, you know, all of it from top to bottom. What were you um, taking exactly in school? Did you continue with the video game course or were you doing, was it something else? No, no, no. Actually, yeah, to backtrack, I actually, I ended up having a heart to heart with the only professor I really respected. <laughs> uh, he was a painting, he was a painting professor. Not um, the break. But guy. he was, yeah, he was the only guy that was actually working. Okay. Um, like he was, he was a very, very talented uh, painter who had, he was in galleries all over the place and just really, he had an air about him that you could tell he wasn't trying to make it. He had already made it. Yeah. Um, so I talked to him and just said, Hey, you know, I don't know where I belong here. You know, I, I, this is what I want to make. And I handed him one of the comics I've made, which was, I hadn't, I was making, I was also working at office Depot in the print in the print uh, department. Oh, it's convenient. So I printed all of my own books, uh, you know, and they were all saddle stitched and really nice presentation. And I handed him one of my comics and he's like, this is a really handsome presentation. Like, you know, I think, you know, if, if this is what you want to do, painting may be the place for you. You know, at least they won't try to shove you in a box because mm. painting is such a wide open space. So I signed up for that. It turns out my professor was a comic fan uh, from the old days. Like he was old, like a, like old Frank Miller, mm. uh, you know, old Neil Adams, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but he told me from day one, like, if you if you ever 
paint Superman in this class, I have to fight. I have to like keep you out of class. <laughs> like you can't. So I respected that. Yeah. Um, so you know, so I was doing the painting thing on top of the comic thing and kind of developing two different aesthetics and learning. And both of them, I think, came back around in my in my comic work eventually. So I and so they were kind of polar opposites that that I think made my work richer in the long run. Mm. Um, so eventually graduated, and the the plan was I'll go to a con every six months, and I'll you know keep this rotation up, new work, new networking, and you know hopefully by the time I graduate, I'll have something to go to. Well, how are your uh, How are your parents feeling about the uh, the career in art? I think my parents were just happy I was staying out of trouble. Uh, um, really, I mean, were, were you a kid they, that got in trouble, or just they just wanted to make sure you were on the right path? Yeah, I mean, they had had. I mean, my family really had a rough go of it. I mean, both both sides of the family kind of came from nothing mm-hmm. and really like burst like busted their ass to like make a life. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they didn't they didn't make excuses about it. They just were hard workers, and I think they would have been happy with me doing whatever, as long as I was kind of walking the straight and narrow path. Mm. Um, so oh, they were just happy that, you know, I, I had found something I cared about. They didn't understand how it would work, mm. but they didn't understand me as a whole. I think like, I was <laughs> always kind of like, like the, my parents, my family is all, they're all like jokesters and they're very outgoing and I'm way more introvert. I'm way more to myself. I'm way more in my head. And, uh, you know, I was in gifted classes and all this stuff. And I think they didn't know what to do with me. Mm. Um, so they didn't understand this, but they didn't understand most things about me. Yeah. Well, they just thought it made you happy. And that was enough, I guess, for them. That's actually sweet. Most people tell the story that their parents were like not happy at all. (laughs) That they got to choose a career in art because most parents want you to succeed and they don't feel like art's something you could succeed in. So, you know, they want the best for you, but they also are very pragmatic about it. So it's it's actually a very sweet to hear a story. That's the other side of it. You don't hear very often. Yeah. And I mean, they knew that I had my head on pretty straight. Like Mm -hmm. I had been working. I mean, I was working with my grandparents. You know, I don't know a lot of kids that were at age seven, like willing to wake up at five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and like go clean toilets. Like (laughs) I was doing that like at a really young age. So I was always driven. I was always working. Um, And I mean, I've always had a job. So they knew that you know, I had some grit apparently, and like I would make something happen. And I wasn't being like I was never the guy who like went out to parties and did all this stuff. Like I was always very like in my room. I had my own projects going. I was I had a trajectory. So they were just super into that. Um, but yeah, so I graduated college in '05 and thought, you know, hopefully I'll have something to go to. Well, that didn't really necessarily happen. So for the next three years, I got a real job. I was working uh, an oil field dispatch. So I was I was the guy on the phones from like 6 p.m. to like 6 a.m., seven days a week. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, basically having to deal with grumpy oil field people. Oil workers. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, the... just, you know, have, having to wake up poor drivers at three in the morning. He says, like, hey, can you drive to Alabama like right now? <laughs> um, wow. So, yeah. So I did they that for three months. years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're that guy. You're the guy. He's <laughs> like, I'm, so, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to do this to you. Um, so I did that for like three years. And uh, around that time, I mean, MySpace was kind of kicking up. You know, there was no Facebook. Didn't have a website, but I used MySpace as basically my portfolio. So I still, I still made art. I still made comics. But the pace had slowed. And plus, I had just gotten married. Um, so like life was shifting. You know, I had responsibilities and whatnot. And all of a sudden, I started getting this interest from the Internet. Like I started uh, I got contacted by this guy named C.B. Sapolsky. Mm, very and familiar. he's like, yeah, he's like, hey, and this is on MySpace. He's like, hey, you love your work. It's got a lot of personality, you know, whatever. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, he sounds like he wants something free from me. Like, who is this guy? <laughs> um, and then I Googled him and he was like the talent scout at Marvel Comics. Mm which seems significant. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, I would cool. say, yeah, all right. Right, right. Yeah. It's like, oh, wow. Like, you're the guy that people go hunt down, but you found me mm-hmm. on MySpace. What are the odds of that happening? Yeah. Um, and from there, we just built a rapport. He was always super supportive. Um, and he basically sort of start, started kind of introducing me to the right people. 
And he introduced me to a guy named Jeremy Ross, who was the president at Tokyo Pop at the the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And I started working for Tokyo Pop off and on for a couple of years because I think they didn't know what to do with me Um, because I'm not exactly manga. You know, I'm manga influenced. Yeah, I could see that. Was manga something you read a lot growing up as well or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was I was a huge uh, Akira Toriyama fan, Ramika Mm. Takahashi. Like I was into all of that but i i i wasn't so i I wasn't a manga artist Mm -hmm. you know i i I took some of the language and rolled it into my style but you know i i wasn't standard manga. i could see the influence but i wouldn't describe it as manga yeah sure yeah Yeah. so they didn't know what to do with me yeah Uh, so they basically had this thing that we were developing i was working with a writer named brandon jerwa and we had developed a story and they didn't know what to do with it and eventually they said hey we're going to do this thing called a pilot program and basically what it means is we're going to pay you barely any money <laughs> to, to make a 30 page comic and it's then we're hard. going to put it on the internet and then we're going to let the people decide if they want to you know see more of this and if they want to see more we'll give you a contract you know and get this rolling which i thought sweet okay fine like i don't mind i don't mind investing mm-hmm. um, so the day i finished it i hit up upload and uh, immediately got a notification saying that Tokyo Pop had cut half of their roster. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> including like the people, including the editor we were working with. Everyone oh, no. was, was just gone. So yeah. we never got paid. It never happened. Oh no. Uh, but the <laughs> oh. one good thing that the one good thing that came of it was uh Brandon, the writer of that project, was good friends with a guy named John Lehman. Oh. Um, and John, I was a fan of John's work. John's, uh, he did a book called Puff, that image comics in the early 2000s. Uh, and it was drawn by a guy named Dave Croslin. And Dave Croslin, amazing artist. And he was also uh, good friends with Jim Food, who was a big influence on me. Mm-hmm. So I, we used to hang around at Jim Food's message boards. And uh, that's how I found Dave's work. And that's how I found John's work. Mm-hmm. And I just followed John's work for years. I just was a big fan. Like he did the Puff thing. He did Scarface. He was kind of all over the place. And then there came a point where John had this really weird book that he was kicking around that all these editors told him, don't make this book. If you make this book, it'll be the end of your career. Just don't make it. (laughs) And John being who John is, John is very stubborn. And he Mm. said, screw you guys. Like I'm just because you're telling me not to do it. I'm absolutely going to do it. Uh, So he saved up all this video game money. He was writing video games and then he needed an artist. So he found, Brandon, his friend, and said, hey, do you know anybody? And then Brandon said, hey, I got this guy that I'm working with, Rob, uh, at Tokyo Pop. Why don't you use him? He's really reliable. And John immediately bristled because he thought, nah, I, don't want, I don't want a garbage like manga artist on this. Yeah, like, you know? yeah. and, but he's like, well, no, he's not really manga, whatever. Here's his website. And he seemed to like it. And I get this random email. Uh, and this happened to be the same week in 2008, where I was deciding I was going to quit uh, my night job mm. because I had I was working around the clock. M- me, my wife and I had opposite schedules. Mm. We weren't seeing each other. We were miserable. And I was starting to get more opportunities in comics. So I thought, you know, this is kind of productive. Like, you know, I have no I'm not going to stay in the oil field. This is not what I'm here for. Mm. You know, so maybe we should take the leap now. We don't have kids yet. Mm. Now is probably the time to do this. So I literally had just decided to quit. And San Diego, San, San Diego Comic-Con was the next day. I was preparing my portfolio to go to, go to Comic-Con. And I had this panic attack. Like I had this really weird kind of anxiety about it suddenly. So I went home to take a shower and just cool off. And then I got out of the shower, checked my email. And this email drops down. It says, hi, Rob from John Layman. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell is this? Had your friend not mentioned exactly that he talked to him? No. Oh, no. okay. So wow. I get the email from John and he's like, hey, Rob, I'm a comic art. I'm a comic writer and I got this thing. You come highly recommended for Brandon Jerwa. It's, I got this comic called Shoe. It's uh, like a dark comedy, sci-fi, you know, you know, cop drama thing. And I, he's like, yeah, you know, it'll be a paying gig. Uh, at least five issues. You know, let me know if you're interested. And I just thought, holy crap, like this is, this is everything. This is, this is so many things coming together. Uh, so immediately, immediately I jumped on it. 
and uh, said, cool, well, I'll be in Comic-Con tomorrow. He was going to be at Comic-Con the next day as well. He sent me the script. He sent me the, the, the pitch. Uh, my wife read it on the plane over before I ever did. Uh, wow. And she immediately turned to me and said, uh, this is going to be huge and you're, you're the guy for it. This is you. Um, and which was a big deal because my wife is, my wife is not a comic fan. Mm-hmm. And she's she's very, very picky, period, mm-hmm. <laughs> just across the board. <laughs> so for her to say that, I knew this would be something special. Um, yeah, well, the so theme, we met we, the theme and the story seem to transcend your standard comic fare, really. I mean, obviously, right. image does lend itself to a lot of things that aren't sort of traditional. And often most of right. their books I, I read and see as a movie or a TV show. Like you just it just mm-hmm. gives you that feel. And that book always right. did. So uh, that's yeah. cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we hooked up the next day. Uh, you know, he was half drunk at a the Hyatt <laughs> hotel and we just ended up talking and, you know, I think hit it off pretty well and said, hey, let's let's do this. So, yeah, that kind of kicked it off from there. Wow. That's an uh, yeah. uh, it's it's a, it's interesting that it was kind of so happenstance to work out the way, because like the art and the story are, are such a great marriage, especially for that concept, because uh, it just like it's such a quirky story, but it, like your art's so great in that the the comedy is there, but there are there are scenes that are truly horrific that you draw so well, mm. and it, it's such a great combination. I I, I think it, you guys really knocked it out of the park for sure. Thanks, man. Yeah, it was really uh, it was really bizarre because I mean I had been knocking around the indies a good seven years before John and I ever got together, and mm. I I had a really hard time finding a, a place for myself in the industry. Um, I had because people looked at my art and immediately thought cartoony mm-hmm. and they thought, you know, all ages kid stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So that's all I ever got. And I would have to, I have to fight with publishers and editors and just telling them over and over again, just trust me. Mm-hmm. Like I can, I can do this. Like I can do more than you think I can do. Just give me the ball. I got this. And no one ever gave me the ball except John. John's the only guy that gave me a shot to just let me do my thing. I find that interesting because there are so many other artists that have done, you know, kind of adult themed stuff that have a similar mm-hmm. style like uh, Vasquez or, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones like Kasqui in, in the um, serial killer. And, and I guess which eventually led yeah. to Invader Zim. But like that stuff's fairly adult oriented and, and it has a cartoony style. I often like when I talk to people about art styles, I'm like it, like, you know, embrace your style and just really go with right. it because, um there's there's a market out there there's some guys that draw spider-man that are way out there when you read the comic and you're just mm-hmm. like all right you know it works like you just gotta right. find your your path um was doug tenapal yeah. uh the inspiration for you at all the earthworm gym guy no no really I, well i mean i was i was a an earthworm gym fan back in the day mm-hmm. um but i actually hadn't i wasn't familiar with his comic work at all i didn't become familiar with his work until really after chew uh, oh, yeah. Doug and I became friendly and everything, and I love his I love his work. But mm-hmm. looking back, I think I think I don't know if it would have appealed to me the same way that a guy like Dave Croslin's or Jim Foods work appealed mm-hmm. to me because there was an edge to it. And I was always kind of really into like the graffiti, the gritty aspect mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. And Doug, Doug, I find is more there's a there's a traditional kind of like innocence to his work mm-hmm. that i love and i appreciate but it's it's just not it wasn't what i was looking for in that time i see not quite as hard an edge so i mean chew was a long run you guys had well, how many issues of that 70 it's 60, 60 60 issues with like four or five one shots mm-hmm. and you got and you did you work on the 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 outer darkness crossover one as well yeah, I did this, yeah. a few pages here and there, but uh, Afu Chan, uh, the the original artist for the book, carried carried the, the the bulk of that one. He killed it. Yeah, yeah, super cool. Yeah. I'm I'm a fan of Layman as well, and I was reading Outer Darkness as well, which is such a cool mm. book. So when did Farmhand yeah. enter the picture? Farmhand entered the picture when I I, I realized she was going to end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I we always projected after we. After we saw we we would have the audience to do it, um, we and we knew sixty issues was always the plan. Um, we wanted to do like you know the 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 classic vertical model. So why the last man transmit? They all ended around sixty. Um, but I, I think in early twenty sixteen, when you know January twenty sixteen, it hit me that holy crap, this is the year it ends. Like mm. what do I do now? Um, and 
you know, she was really the first book I ever, I ever carried the art side of, because again, everything up to that point was just, you know, eight pages here, 10 pages there, that kind of thing. Um, so, and I had gotten into such a groove of just, I was a page a day guy, you know, for eight years, I had a stable gig as you possibly could get in comics of just, okay, I know what I'm doing, doing this page today. That's it. Um, so I, I, when that hit me, I think I immediately started going through all the old ideas I had. Cause I mean, there's, I mean, I think most creatives tend to have a lot of random ideas that kind of pop up over the years. Mm -hmm. So I had just tons of post-it notes and stuff all over the place. And so I started rifling through all that stuff in January, 2016. And I hated everything. It's like, this is <laughs> none of this is like, all of this is just like not right for right now for what yeah. I want to do. So I kind of put it away. And there was this random Sunday where, you know, I think we were like getting ready for church or something. And like, I, I sat down in, in my room and I looked out of our bedroom and then we have a tree uh, around the pond in our backyard. And for some reason I had this thought and I pictured this, I had this image in my head of like body parts hanging off the tree and like body parts growing out of the roots and, and all this other stuff. And I immediately had a hook. And I thought, oh, it's an organic farmer who grows human organs. Mm -hmm. Like, that's so punny. It's got to, someone has to have done this already. Yeah. Um, so I immediately liked it. I immediately got that tonally and probably in line with what I liked, which was, mm -hmm. you know, it, it could be horror and it could be sci-fi drama, but it could also be kind of goofy and silly and gross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I thought, oh, this, this is, there's something there. And Usually around that time, whenever I used to get an idea, I, I, I'd immediately run to Google and see if someone else had done it. Mm -hmm. And without fail, every time I did that, there was something comparable and it just killed all of my enthusiasm. Yeah. So this time I decided, screw it. I'm not going to do that. I like this so much. I'm just going to keep it. Um, and it just started kind of growing from there. Like all of 2016, as I was finishing Chew, I was developing Farmhand mm -hmm. um, and it kind of became more than the original hook you know it started becoming this family drama more than it probably was uh, a body part horror kind of thing mm. um and it just grew from there and i mean 20 i i wrote the first i finished to november 1st 2016 uh and then uh, about a month later for about a month, I basically just walk around my house in my robe, just confused, <laughs> just lost. <laughs> just I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I mean, I, I came home. I'll never forget. I finished I finished the final page, finished color, coloring the last page of Chew at my office, closed up my laptop, went home, and walked in the kitchen. My wife's cooking. And I was like, well, I just finished Chew today. She's like, cool. Well, you mind helping me with these kids? <laughs> that was like, like there, was no, there was no party there was no anything it was just yeah. like wow what what just happened here yeah it's not um, like finishing a movie so, or a tv show you have some like, cast <laughs> party you just finish your laptop and then go back to your life yeah, it's quite a quite a I have to change, sort of a I, I have to change this diaper now <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah congratulations so, here's a shitty diaper <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. so the next the next month i was just really lost and mm -hmm. you know i ended up in that month uh you know, after that month of being lost, writing the first issue for Farmhead, which I, I rewrote it probably like four or five times. And I finally hit it. And I thought, OK, this is I think that, I think I got it now. Mm -hmm. So all of 20, 2017 was then just writing and starting Farmhead. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. And, and we're like years how, or uh, what? Your books have sort of kept the finger on the pulse of sort of hipster you know douchebaggery going on like the like chew is very much chew is very much like the artisanal food side of things um but like you know obviously ramping that up to a different level and having all these uh, people with psychic powers based around food um which is which is fantastic and, and that was came right on the cusp of like all these cooking shows and all this like you know all these things that that focus on these sort of new restaurants that are all like fusion restaurants and weird stuff and i loved how hard he leaned into that and uh and now with your new book which is uh which you're writing and, and drawing um it's all about like this organic farming and and it's all you know the word organic is such a buzzword that could mean anything really that people put on everything and and like the fact that it's organic human body parts is just such a right. especially with the the biotech field and everything that's going on with that it's just such a great yeah. marriage and idea i'm really glad like i understand uh what you're saying about the frustration for 
finding ideas. Like I did an indie book for like an issue and uh, that was the steampunk like um, Ebenezer Scrooge thing. So just sort of continued on from a Christmas Carol where he has like becomes a steampunk and fights crime and, and uh, you know, um, Cratchit gets put in a robot body and all this sort of stuff. And I really enjoyed it. And then like, I remember looking at the the diamond previews after the first issue came out and there's someone else literally doing the exact same thing. <laughs> And it was, my book was called Humbug and his book was called Humbug. And I was like, well, <laughs> like he's already made it to Diamond. He's way ahead right. of me. So that's right. it. You know, right. and that uh, I can I can understand the frustration just capping you right off of the bit. But I'm yeah. uh, really excited that uh, you got to put that book out and it's continuing to come out. So it's fantastic. Were you involved at all with like the because there was a pilot for two, right? That never got picked up. Uh, we never got to the pilot. We ended up uh, there were a lot of pilot scripts written. Mm -hmm. uh, by various writers um so yeah it's been options a handful of times and uh it, it's the closest i think we got one script back in 20 this is 2011 2012 mm. um, really that far that long was, ago wow oh yeah yeah wow. we, had, we yeah. got one we got one script from a guy named brian duffield who's who's uh he's a he's a giant fan he's an amazing uh television writer movie writer mm -hmm. Um, but he's he's become a friend over the years because he he actually was a true fan who sought it out and he nailed it. I mean, we had we had a perfect script. I mean, he it was it was live action and it was probably as accurate as you, as you could probably get with Chu with live Andrew, action. Was Ken Leong? Is that the one that he was attached to? No one. No, he was never attached. Oh, really? To, OK, we, I'm just going on what I we saw were, on the Internet, but maybe it was just dream, yeah. dream casting or whatever. But. Oh yeah, it was Dreamcast, and we had actually sent it to him. So mm. we had some back and forth with him, just personally, mm. and he 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 seemed to enjoy it and that sort of thing, and be open to it. And we also uh, another person we had a talk we had back and forth with was uh, Mark Hamill. Oh uh, really? Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill was a big fan, actually. Um, really? And he he yeah. Mark fan. Mark Mark Hamill loved it, and we told him we wanted him as Mason Savoy. I was going to uh, say he had to be Mason, right? Like that would have been a perfect yes. role for him. Yes. And he, he seemed to be really into the idea. Uh, but then all of the Star Wars stuff just kind of started coming out. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's but yeah, we had the one script from Brian Duffield, which was perfect. And things kind of went south from there. Um, Showtime, we were working with Showtime at the time and, you know, they got the script back. It was it was as it was funny. And it was it was really kind of riveting in a lot of ways and just captured all the best things of the comic. And, you know, they they responded in stereotypical Hollywood uh, change all this, you know, well, they they their response was, well, I mean, you know, it, it's it's it may be too weird, which <laughs> I thought was a really weird like thing to say about it. I mean, the entire premise is weird. I mean, the weirdness. Yeah. You, this is what you paid for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. what you asked for. Uh, but they thought that the bird flu aspect of it with the cannibal cop aspect of it was too much. You needed one, but not the other. So, you know, of course they picked, you know, let's keep the cannibal cop, but lose the bird flu. But, you know, the problem with that is the bird flu is the entire plot. Yeah, it does. So, it circles you know, right back around. Right. So when you yeah. take that out, now you have to, like, start making things up. Uh, which is kind of what happened. That just ended up being the death knell of the entire thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we went from there. We went and started a started producing an animation or an animated uh, adaptation. Okay. And we got pretty far with that. We never got the animation. We did a bunch of recording. Uh, David oh, Tennant really? was was Mason Savoy. Oh wow! Um, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Steve uh, Stephen uh, Yun uh, was uh, he was oh. Tony. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. And, yeah, and uh, Felicia Day was uh, Amelia Mintz. Oh wow! So we, yeah, we had a, a fantastic cast. cast for sure. It was a fun cast, yeah. and they were all fans. Uh, yeah. and it just never happened. Um, oh, so wow. we were. She was had a rough go of it. Um, Are the rights tied so, up with someone now because of that, or do you guys still have the option to take it wherever you wish to go? It is tied up with someone. We okay. haven't announced it yet. Um, if if it does happen, it will be very exciting. It seems um, it, it seems if, like if, a Netflix thing, so I'm hoping that's where you're going. But I'll I'll, I'll keep my ears peered for it. Yeah, because I mean happen, they've been putting out all these weird indie comics. Like I'm a huge Sweet right. Tooth fan as well, and uh, the fact that that got a show on Netflix, a really good show. Um, right. You know, it really like gave me my uh, a lot of hope for a lot of these strange indie books that mm -hmm. you know could make it to the big screen now. Because I think it was successful. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean we're 
Hollywood's a weird thing, man. Oh, I mean, sure. we've, uh, yeah, we, we've dabbled in it a few times with mm-hmm. Chew, and I had an experience with Farmhand where I optioned it back in 2019, 2019, mm-hmm. 2020, and spent basically the last couple of years working with AMC uh, mm-hmm. for, for a Farmhand. That would be an awesome place for and, it. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. But, I mean, you just learned that it's just a strange, strange industry. Um, there's a lot of, like, hurrying up and you know hurry up and wait essentially yeah. in hollywood which can be really frustrating when you're trying to do a comic career at the same time mm. um so it's it's i think after kind of dipping our toes into the hollywood thing i've come away from it probably appreciating comics more mm. um but yeah, i think simpler. there's a pure yeah there's a yeah. purity to it there's a purity to it that i don't have to i don't have to wait for conference calls with executives i don't have to wait for permission I, you know, I just make, and it, it's, I control how fast it comes out. I control like putting it mm. in stores. Like, I mean, this is, there's a simplicity to this. That's just really pleasant. Um, yeah. I can imagine, so, yeah. especially since everything in film is done by committee. Like, you know, all oh, it takes yeah. is one executive has no sweet idea. He's probably never read the comic and, you know, or even looked at it to say, ah, oh, right. it doesn't need to be bird flu, you know, <laughs> or, or something <laughs> right, dumb like right. that. It's like watching why last man and go, do we need to kill all of the men? Like, you know, right, like right, they just right. have these dumb ideas that, that totally fly in the face of whatever the core concept is. And they have no frame of reference because they don't care. Like it's, yeah, yeah. at least with comics, it's you, your writer and probably your editor. And that's about it. Right. Like, so. Yeah. And I mean, and I mean, with us, with Chew, I mean, we had no editor. I mean, right, if you're yeah. working with, yeah, if you're working with Image Comics, I mean, you know, you can hire your own editor, mm-hmm. but I mean, they're not going to do it for you. I mean, it's only, I think it's only been in the last six years or so that they've actually started having like a proofreader. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I mean, we, there was none of that back when we were making Chew. I mean, they were just, we just sent them the files and they were like, cool. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and we got the book. Yeah. Um, I think they've, they've gotten a bit more, uh, they pay attention, I think, a bit more to what's in the comics now than they ever did back when we were making Chew. Yeah, well, it seems like like I had this discussion with, um, I think it was Roman per, uh, Perez about it. And it was about like a lot of books seem nowadays to come out almost like like the book itself is like a pilot. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like they're like, this is, could, could be a show. So like the, right. it, it, to me, it really feels like they're tightening up that process in a way that they can just hand these books off to studio executives and say, here's you know, here was your first, your, your pilot episode or whatever yeah. and, and, uh, and get the core concept sort of right in their hands in a, in a storyboarded format right away. So it's yeah, kind of genius yeah, it's, in a way like that. But it's taken a while for comics to really catch up with Hollywood in that way. But now it seems like they're really running. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I have mixed feelings about all of it to be completely yeah, I can honest. Ima- I can imagine, especially I mean, like as an artist with your vision of what the story been, like if mm-hmm. it does get a live action treatment, which I really, really hope it does. Um, I imagine looking at what they come up with based on what you had done would be, would be quite surreal for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I, I think, I mean, for me, I, I'm kind of weary. I'm, I think I'm more weary about making comics and using comics as a stepping stone. Yeah. I mean, that that's, and maybe, I mean, I, I can be idealistic. You know, I think there's, there's some, there's just a purity again. I'm like very focused on like, making sure my motives are are in the right place and making sure that I'm focused on like making this thing the best I can. If Hollywood comes along, that's fine. Yeah. But I think, you know, basically treating, treating the comic like a means to an end. Yeah. Just seems like such a disrespect to the medium. Yeah. And it Um, it taints what it will be because if you're writing it, like I remember there's a period where Mark Miller's books, almost everything he put out seemed to be a pitch for a movie. Like even the, mm-hmm. the artists was drawing the people to look like, <laughs> like when Wanted came out, I remember reading that book going, okay, well there's Eminem, there's Halle Berry. Like he literally drew right. it to match right. actors that would play them in the movie. So uh, right. it got to a point like that. It was like, this just seems like it's just, he, this is like a stepping stone to get to a movie, which it did. So right. I guess it worked. Right. Which like, I, I, I tend to, be, like, I actually, I'm a big fan of Mark Miller. Like, oh, I me, think me too. I, give, I love his work. I give, but it... Yeah. I give him a pass, but like, <laughs> no, I think knowing him a bit and knowing his MO, like he's so big picture. Like yeah. he, there's a, there's a vision casting thing he's doing. Like, mm-hmm. it's not like, he doesn't feel like a shill to me. He mm-hmm. just feels like a guy who's like, I'm going to make this story. 
and it's eventually it's going to be a movie and it's going to star Eminem. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like he just throws it out there. And yeah. like, next thing you know, it's actually happening. Mm. Um, that's but, true. So he I, does, I, yeah, no, he certainly yeah. has. He has he's big, big, big sky uh, planning. That's for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, it bugs me when I see someone making a comic and it's just uh, and you could tell there's no soul to it. There's just mm-hmm. this is this is a this is a mechanical transaction that's happening. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't you know, I don't hate anybody that's doing it. I just I can tell when you're doing it. Like yeah. I can see I think the average reader is smart enough to sense uh, w- when the when the motivation behind it isn't right. Mm. Like you can tell like, yeah. OK, this is either either you're this isn't a story. This is a political statement mm. or it's you know, it's it's a means to an end that you're trying to get some Hollywood contract. You can kind of sense those things. Yeah. But you can also sense when someone is pouring their heart into something and they're making something really sincere. And yeah, I just I try to lean t- more toward the sincerity aspect. And I'm always questioning. I think that's probably my biggest my wife's best contri- contribution to me as a storyteller was like, you know, when we started dating and she was a really big fan of my work. She loved she believed in my work even mm-hmm. back in college. But the question she asked me was I was working on this particular project. And her question to me was, why are you making this? And I had never thought of it. You know, I just made stuff because you just make stuff. Um, But she actually asked them about the motivation. And it's stuck with me ever since. So to this day, before I start a project, I'm asking myself, why am I trying? Why am I making this? Mm. You know, is it just is it just about a check or is it because I actually have a story to tell here? Um, Which, you know, maybe is a privileged position, but it's one I, I have. Well, no, it's, it, it, I, I totally agree. You, you read some books, like I, I read a lot of comics and generally, you know, you read the new Marvel event or whatever, and it, it does feel a bit heartless. It's just, you know, getting across whatever the thing is they need to do to get to the next big thing they want to do. But, uh, yeah. and, and not always the case. So you can tell in some artists' stories, like, you know, in Spider-Man or some other things, people have real love for the character and it does show through. But um, right. especially in like Farmhand, which of course would be, because being just the artist before, but now being being the writer as well. Um, you know, there, there's a real through line with like the father son dynamic and uh, and that sort of story on top of just the the standard, you know, premise. There's a lot of stuff that seems like it's personal to you, which is which which really bleeds through. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of life happened like on shoe mm-hmm. that, um, you know, I, I started you, you know, me and my wife were only married for a year. We had no kids. And by the time she was over, we had had we had just had our third child we had been married almost a decade and it's like a lot of life happened during that time and uh you know the thing about having kids is you know after you have a kid I think for me at least I started reflecting on my own childhood immediately Mm -hmm. like I started reflecting on you know okay I'm doing this with my son you know how could my parents do that with me when I was like you started looking back Mm -hmm. and asking questions and, you know, I was dealing with all that while making Chew, but Chew wasn't the place for it. You know, mm-hmm. Chew, Chew wasn't the, the place to pour that stuff out. No. So whenever Farmhand came around, I realized, oh, I think this is the story. Like, this is going to be like this really personal story that, you know, isn't, isn't autobiographical, but it will take all of the anxieties and like the fears and like the grief I was having. Mm-hmm. And like, pour, let's just pour it all into this one story mm-hmm. and, uh, and see what happens. Yeah, no, it's it's a super cool book, and I'm super excited to see uh, see where it goes from here. Um, did I cover everything? Is there anything about your life I missed? Is some important? I, that, that's that's a lot. <laughs> I think we got most yeah. of it in there. So you have three kids now. Yeah, yeah, we got three. Uh, wow. You know, my youngest is five, my daughter is seven, and my oldest son is uh, is ten. Oh, ten. That's gonna be funny. Yeah, he's he's got he's not super angsty but mm-hmm. he's getting some of that teenage angst a bit you know uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So the world the world is uh the world the world's starting to get to him <laughs> <laughs> well he's 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 really smart like yeah. he's he's in the gifted classes at school and he oh, knows he's smart he knows he's smart um, <laughs> oh he's so dangerous he's, now yeah but yeah. he's in the process of he's in the process of being humbled ah uh, um, i see because he's he's yeah he's in an, they just started school about a month ago and he's in this class that's like all of the best and brightest of his school. Mm. And now he's being tested in some ways that he's yeah. never been tested before. Uh, um, so quite a it'll big be fish good. in a small pond anyway. 
Yeah. yeah. So it'll be good for him character, his character. But uh, he's not, I don't think he's enjoying it all that much. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, creative inclinations from the kids? Like, do they, do they lean into comics as well? Yeah. Well, my, I, we did our best because my wife's creative also. I mean, oh, we, she, we met, yeah, we met in painting. Oh, um, but she she's she basically took her aesthetic and applied it to like home building. No, oh, so really? really. Yeah. She's a really, really successful like home builder. But she also she has like both sides of her brain fire. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of them, like she can handle like the math end of it of like actually drawing a house that is actually like realistic that people can live in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she also is like has a really sound design sense. So like she's oh. amazing with like color and all that stuff um so yeah i I think we tried not to push that on our kids you know Mm -hmm. we didn't want to be the the ones that are the parents that are like well you got to be an artist too um (laughs) like we kind of like left it to them and we we would expose them to stuff and well maybe started maybe she get a beret that might help (laughs) (laughs) i'm sure they would love that yeah Um, (laughs) but i they but they basically started kind of gravitating on their own so Mm -hmm. my oldest son uh he's he's always been in the comics um i mean just being around me i guess mm. um but now he's starting to kind of like love to draw on his own coming with the, coming up with his own characters and that sort of thing uh but my but he's also again he's in his head and he's very sort sort of self-critical uh meanwhile my daughter who's seven is she's got this raw 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 talent to her that's really really kind of special um, she doesn't really think about, okay, is this perfect? She doesn't think about what are people going to think about this? She just goes at it. Like she actually drew her first, uh, book, her, her, her like, like, it's like a 30 page, like book thing that she made about this dinosaur. Mm-hmm. And she didn't tell us she was going to do it. We didn't like give her the idea. She just started kind of like sneaking away and just drawing this thing out. And like, she's, she's reading and writing now. So she wrote it out and, you know, she had us buying the book and everything. And, wow. you know, and it's like we like she had the follow through to go make this thing yeah. happen. And it's like, holy crap. Like, I know adults that don't. Yeah, I was going to say, I know a lot through. of 40 year olds that can't do that. Right, <laughs> That's right. amazing. Wow. It's yeah, like she's so, the right path as well. It's not like the kids are getting the I've, best, uh, the best of both yeah. worlds from, from you and your wife. Yeah. And our youngest, we have no idea. I mean, he's <laughs> uh, he's really, really into uh, he's he's he was in a hitting things phase for a while. Like he was like, this, he's like this little stocky little bruiser and he would just run into things on purpose. <laughs> it was like, what do you do with this? Um, but now he's in, he's in school for the first time this year and he's mm. uh, his brain is activated and he's coming home and he's like enjoying school, which is oh, awesome. Cause we, yeah. we were a little afraid that we'd be getting the calls from the teachers. Like he's hitting everyone in the class. <laughs> he just barreled uh, through the teacher. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I don't know if the creative thing will rub off on him. We'll see, but yeah, yeah, no. it seems like it's got, it's got legs in the family. Oh, that's awesome. Oh man. Well, it was super cool talking to you, Rob. Thank you so much for being on. No, man. Appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, have a have a good rest of your day. You too, man. All, All right. right. Talk to you later. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Man, what a great interview. Rob is a super interesting guy. Uh, learning his history, learning uh, you know how true came to be and all, all of that kind of back-end stuff about the struggle to, to get the show to, as a TV show or a movie, a reality. It was super interesting, and man, I really, really hope we get to see Chew on a TV screen sooner than later because it is such a good book. So good. And I know I talk at length about how much I love it with him, and I've said at length here how much I love it, but I can't tell you how great it is. You just have to go read it. Go read Chew. Order it now. Go to your local comic store, and if it's not local, make a trip. You know, I mean, order it online if you have to, I guess, but I'd really prefer you go to a local shop, order it, pick it up, even the bookstore, right? Because trades are available at your local bookstores as well. So, you know, support them if you don't have a comic book store. Go to the bookstore. Get them to order it. But, man, go get it. It's so good. Uh, yeah, so thank you for tuning in once again to another great episode. I will agree. <laughs> I called it a great episode. That's kind of funny. A bit presumptuous on my point. Uh, but, you know, I thought it was pretty great. I hope you did as well. 
Uh, but thank you for tuning in, and I will see you in two weeks' time with another great interview.